Welcome to Swim Podcast, episode number six. Now, if the uh, audio quality of this intro is immediately offending you, then tough shit. I was actually recording it in my studio with proper equipment, but there was like a weird noise coming through the wall, which sounded like uh, like one of my neighbours was riding a tiny dirt bike round and round in their garden or uh, maybe dismembering a body with a chainsaw, perhaps even both, because it is Essex after all. So, um, yeah, now I've had to come in the house and record this on my phone, which is well punk. So, appropriately enough, the guest on this one is Jacob Bannon of Converge. And the band were in London recently to play one of the Blood Moon shows, which was a short run of shows they did. They did here, and they also did Roadburn Festival, where... They played the slower, more expansive and epic Converge songs and a Cure cover um, and were joined on stage by Stephen Brodsky of, um, you know, like Cave In and Mutoid Man and Ben and Chelsea of Chelsea Wolf. And all of them were were playing and switching instruments and it it was a truly incredible show. So this podcast was recorded after they sound checked and um, it was the first time Jake and I had actually like sat down face to face and had a chat like we'd spoken on the phone a couple of times for like interviews for um, for the BBC and we'd emailed a bunch because I'd done a couple of bits of artwork for Death Wish but yeah we never actually had the chance to sort of sit down and chat so um, I think it went pretty well actually like we spoke for an hour and a half it's the longest podcast I've done and we covered all topics like Converge and these Blood Moon shows and also what that might mean for the future. Also, we spoke about um, him running Death Wish Records, his artwork and design stuff as well. And, uh, we yeah, we cover a broad range of topics, and I think it's pretty interesting. Um, if you agree with me and you want to subscribe on iTunes and write us a nice review and tell your mates and all of that, that would rule. Thanks. Um, I should also point out that that after setting up my equipment and testing the levels, I started recording um, and we kind of sort of hit the ground running straight into it. And uh, while I was sort of faffing around trying to get my notes together, he was looking through my sketchbook, which is the book that I do all the uh, portrait paintings in for the covers of these these podcasts. And you can, you'll can you see that the cover image for this one is the portrait I did of him um, after the fact. You could see that online. It starts off a bit sketchy, but um, but we really get into it. So check it out. This is Jacob Bannon. So yeah, I don't know how to start really because I don't know like this is the way to start. Broad, this is the way to start because there's such a broad amount of stuff I want to talk about. Okay, sure. Um, I'm sure we'll go off on tangents and uh, answer a variety of them. Cool. Is this your your daily book? May I look? Take yeah, it? of course. No judging. No, it's it's quite okay. I never judge. <laughs> never judge. You always put so much so much work into this. It's great when I see you post. Thanks, man. This is a, a good reason to paint, mm-hmm. you know, because obviously each episode has to have a like a cover image. Certainly. Um, so, and I work better if I set myself a brief. And I've been painting way more portraits just because mm-hmm. I feel I need to, you know, get my in a way like you know it's like practicing guitar. Sure. You know. Thank you. A way of getting better. So that, that's the plan anyway. Trying. Oh, it's that's how you keep your chops up. Exactly. That's one of the hardest things I find uh, as a visual artist and being so busy and sort of multitasking quite a bit, having the time yeah. to 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 essentially uh, practice and work out experiments and, and ideas that I would need visually without having a deadline or without doing them for. Uh, a specific project or client or, yeah. or something like that. More more often than not, I don't get that opportunity, so I kind of have to do it while I'm making something for somebody. Yeah. Um, where I, at times, I wish I had the time to be able to, you know, work things out in yeah. in advance. You know. Well, this is the thing I've found that I'm trying to set aside a bit of that time, mm-hmm. and you know how it is. It's like art mm-hmm. and music. It's it's one of those things where it just becomes. Sure. Uh, it, it goes from being immersive to crushingly oppressive. Do you know what I mean? Certainly. Well, yeah. That, that's that's because you're so uh, psychologically and emotionally invested in, in it that the, the process uses both sides of your brain in such a way that there's always a constant push and pull and always a constant struggle. Yeah. So yeah, this, sure. 
that's what I'm trying to do anyway. So that's yeah, great. so I prep pages first. Like yeah. this is a, this is early stages. I was doing it on oh, uh, on the see. yeah on the train. I did a bit of paint before I left home. And okay, and just just do some backgrounds and stuff. Yeah, building. yeah. And, then, and and you you obliterate and sort of bury stuff sometimes if you're yeah. not happy with it and start. So yeah, that's great. Well, quite often I'll do like just for bigger pieces. I'll do um, I'll do a whole first. Mm-hmm. Uh, initial painting which is very immediate and yeah, quick pressure, yeah just a quick sketch and that will be all the the reference points oh of sorry that's okay. Okay. all the reference points of, yeah. of what I want to sure. try and convey mm-hmm. and then I'll paint over that and then start the image which is going to be the final image yeah. because I feel that it's a little hokey but I feel that um, they're still there mm-hmm. you know well they are yeah yeah. Uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, because when, but you're, I, when I believe that you, they're still there to be perceived. Sure, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and you have that that visual reference, and you're almost you're almost pulling out uh, the strongest characteristics that already made an impression in your mind as to yeah. what you, what's there. And you, so when you even if you see like an obliterated background, you can still see the hint of the eye or the hint of a cheekbone or something that was yeah. a strong physical feature that you want to make sure it comes through. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it helps. Yeah, and I think it, it's also to do with uh, getting in the right mindset. Because I, f- I find painting and drawing really meditative, and I find it a, a way of, um, yeah, like I said, time just just goes away. Yeah, which is which is really uh, annoying for those for for those people. waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good move. Hi. Oh, it's all right. Um, yeah. I'm just going to grab a hoodie. Don't mind me. I won't say anything. Just go on with your interview. It's no big <laughs> deal, guys. Just, no. yeah, I'll, yeah, don't worry about it. So, uh, oh, it's so nice out. Do you want to interview the gong? <laughs> Can we bring the gong on the bus? Yeah. Just... I believe Kurt posted earlier a snippet of it where we, uh, he started interviewing the gong. Uh, interviewing Gor- Boris's gong and asking about the tour and it would and, and its influences and it answers. Amazing. So you know it's it's pretty great. And there's a, a three minute version that's really really good. <laughs> nice. Do you um how how has this been? Because how many shows have you done now? Two. Is it two so far? Two so far. Yeah. And um, you know a lot of preparation leading up to doing the shows. Yeah. Um, about. Uh, a week's worth of practice and you know rehearsals with the full bands to just get used to the just the dynamics of everything yeah um and we did a lot of preparation on our own leading up to that we did some demo recordings um that was just the the four of us the traditional band that uh we passed on to ben and chelsea yeah and just to sort of show them what we were going for and how we're doing other people's what you yeah we did other people's parts exactly and there's some there's some stuff that we um that we rewrote and did like new renditions of songs and the pacing was a little bit different so we wanted to sort of uh have a blueprint to to work from and uh yeah so we i had to learn some some bass and guitar parts that were are relatively simple to i would say and a, a seasoned guitarist yeah. and, and bass player, and I, I can play everything. Um, I wouldn't say well. I can I can I can get down just about anything if I have you know fifty takes to do it. Yeah. You know, and I feel comfortable with it because um, I record a lot of things on my own and write a lot of things on my own. Um, but it's just different pressure live. You know, yeah. you're you're on the fly. You have to you have yeah. to be be you know decent the first time. So Kurt gave us some. Uh, uh, some instructional videos as to how he wanted things played and stuff like that because you know you can embellish and do a lot of things that yeah. can can potentially take away from a song so um, yeah we had a we had a lot of homework I think that's great yeah and really, I, yeah and I, and I think to even contemplate doing this undertaking I think it's a, it's a you know I was super I was as excited as everybody else mm-hmm. sure I think. thank I think you it's, I think the prospect of it is great I'm really looking forward to it and I think um, you know, before we started recording, and you were saying about uh, the prospect of recording it, and perhaps even videoing it, like mm-hmm. making a, a document of it. It's um, it's only going to open more doors, isn't it, for you, as far as a creative process? Possibly. You know, as a band, we've always had a, a lot of dynamics in our songs, yeah. but we're also predominantly known for being, you know, a loud, aggressive, fast band. Um, but our albums always have moments that flex a different kind of dynamic. Hmm. 
and a lot of that gets just simply gets lost and we can't really do that in a live setting whether it be time limitations or just the pacing of things uh, as a when you when you're you know a punk rock and hardcore band you you want to play at full volume and you want to play loud and there's a nervous energy that forces you to to do that and when you're playing slow and longer emotional material it's a bit uh you feel a bit exposed in a, in a variety of ways uh, artistically psychologically whatnot you're not really hiding behind the, the volume and the, the intensity of yeah. things uh so yeah that um it's just a different different vibe you know like a lot of set, a lot of our sets are predetermined by time you know, when we're on a typical tour, we can play for like an hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. And we try to fit as much material in that time as possible. And you can't please everybody. And sometimes we, we the, the the slower songs and the more dynamic songs that we could try to, to do, we just, you know, we can cross that one off and do three other two minute songs. And, yeah. and that's usually what we've done. So this idea has been cooking for for years to, to try to do something like this and try to just play all all slow things whether it be you know writing an album that was all slow or just performing live in a in a larger big band setting uh, we started talking about doing this specific one maybe a, a year or two ago and uh, we all had um, some some friendships already with with all the people involved and just the timing was right uh, Chelsea and Ben and Steve had a free uh, two weeks to be able to to basically contribute to all of this and you know we said let's put it together yeah the way, I guess w with so much to undertake with getting a set together there's there's not really those opportunities where you're gonna or have there been I mean you were saying you were doing long rehearsals where you're actually gonna everyone's gonna be in a room and ev you know those instances where someone will start playing something and, and something will come out of it and somebody will go here's something in it and go are those happening or well, have they happened they, they, they I think they started happening in some of those rehearsals and you know they were all, we were all talking about our schedules and stuff and their tour schedules and their you know writing schedules and things like that and when you start having a little bit of free time and you go you have like a little riff idea or something um, we go hey yeah we should just write a record let's just mm. do this you know and um, but you know again things are, are really fluid and really organic and you never know if that'll even happen you know because yeah. uh, we're just we're we're all so busy i mean aside from this you know we're still a functioning you know regular four-piece you know aggressive hardcore punk metal band yeah. um so that that also is you know in the middle of of crafting a record that we've been working on like you know sort of in a piecemeal manner over the last you know, couple of years yeah and uh you know we have we have that that sort of internal clock going um no pressure because it's you know our clock but we you know we feel the the need and the itch and the drive to to do that and to to make something together at this point that's also loud and, and wild mm. but you know you have to remember too as a band you know uh, we all have other things going on mm. uh, you know kurt is an established engineer and his schedule dictates a lot of our a, a lot of our availability even to each other yeah. you know um so uh, for all of us to get together and work on song ideas, it's determined by you know how much free time he has in the studio because we we've always rehearsed in the studio and practiced in the studio oh, okay. and write in the studio, not write and record at the same time, but we just practice in the live room. Mm. And uh, we all have uh, families and other jobs and you know in other, in some instances you know other full time bands other like more project oriented uh, you know, musical things and whatnot and uh, there's only so much time in the day. Yeah, well that's that's something I I, I think has been quite a recurring theme with with a, quite a few of the people that I speak to, especially like the last the last podcast was with John okay. uh, Basley, and um, I wonder how. I mean, how you personally divide up your time in that way, because these are, you know, we, if you're a visual artist, well, as you are, what I'm, what I'm saying is anyone that is a visual artist and also a musician, those are both things which are, which you have a calling to. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and to a certain degree, 
um, little controller. I don't know. I, I don't know how that is for you, but for me personally, mm -hmm. I find that yeah, as as we s were talking earlier, that um, the idea of when you're working on a project, time runs away. Sure. Um, in, in equally in the same way, there's when something needs to be drawn or painted or recorded or worked out on a guitar, whatever in whatever format it is mm -hmm. that you work in, you, you don't have a lot of say over that. You, in, in you the know. way in the way of getting it down like it, it's very like this needs to happen now I, I it becomes like a compulsion for me and I, he was yeah. saying that it's very much the same way is that how it is for you um in some ways yes i mean it, it, it's difficult like when i when i leave home in the morning you know about 8 a.m hmm. and get into death wish in my in in my my room at death wish around you know 8 8 15 8 30 uh usually there's a a stack of things that i need to accomplish that day or or that week and you know i make lists and start you know chomping at them and some things are very creative and some things are really artistically free and it's about making visual art um, for a specific client or for yeah. or a specific project or something like that um, but for me, a lot of it is dictated by by that schedule. So my freedom, I, I would, I would, I think I would flourish more and have more fun, and it would be a little more fulfilling if I had that sort of freedom. Mm. Um, but you know, economics also don't they dictate a lot of things. You know, so I can't I can't give all my time to you know like uh, abstract color experiments like I would want to. You know, that yeah, that would be really fun and be yeah. really exciting for me. Um, Music is a is a different thing for me where it's it's very impulsive and it happens very quickly. So if I have a, a like a, a musical idea or you know a riff idea or just some sort of general song idea, uh, I document it as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how that, that's one of the things that I really actually like about uh, today's technology having yeah. it right there. You know, is before I would just be like. You know, just hoping I can get to a tape recorder or mm -hmm. like a four track or something yeah. and get and rough out an idea, you know. But now I can, yeah, I can capture the basic nuances of a song or a lyrical idea really quickly, yeah. really Even on if the it's fly. Just using a phone, which if you're just using a, using yeah. a phone. Um, I mean, I still you know carry around you know a notebook and a and a, you know a, a few notebooks and things and you know but yeah a phone is is a wonderful tool for that sort of thing just to just to rough out an idea and have it there and have it documented and you know being able to to reference it at a later time and just kind of put it in the bank i mean right now i have over a hundred song ideas that are in my phone that i haven't even touched yeah um because these things are very fleeting i find they are fleeting and uh inspiration comes at the strangest times and that yeah. you can't really um you can't really control that. Yeah, I mean, some people, I, I suppose, could. Uh, from a visual perspective, it's the same. You know, if I have a basic idea or if I'm inspired by something, I, I try to capture some little element of that that I can reference at a, at a later time. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, my separating the things on a, on a daily, like a, sort of like an, in, in a work day, it's very difficult. Uh, it's usually a combination of things for me. Um, since I'm, you know, working at Death Wish full time mm. all day, there's a wide variety of things that go on with that that are um, more music business oriented things than they are, uh, you know, artistically fulfilling things. Um, but, but I'm, you know, I'm still writing copy and writing bios and yeah. making every single promotional image for a band and. Uh, just doing all the back end invisible things that a lot of people don't see or think of or need to think of yeah. that make a, a, a release or a band uh, just exist. Do you, um, how do you deal with those things? Do you enjoy them? Or, I do. Or do you see them as a means to an end? I do enjoy them. Um, they're, I think I, I enjoy them. I enjoy them quite a bit, and I think the reason is they're always different. Um, every band is different. Every band character yeah. is different. So every th every time a release that we're working with, you know, comes comes to me, and I'm and now it's my part. My my part of the of the puzzle is 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 now uh, super important. Um, I really take the time to try to sort of capture the the character and the identity of a band, and really try to understand it, where a band's coming from and where releases 
trying to go artistically. You know, there isn't really a cookie cutter approach. I see, I see labels have a cookie cutter approach all the time when they have like similar bios or don't have bios at all, or, you know, put a band in a, in a specific setting for, you know, a, a photo or an album cover looks the same as the previous one or whatever. And, you know, we try to look at every every band as its own unique animal and, and, and treat it as such with that kind of respect. I mean, how, how do you go about selecting the bands for the label? Because I, mean, it's, it's, I can imagine that... Um, because I, I look at the roster and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and each of the bands, that it's clearly... It's obvious why they're there. Mm-hmm. Sure. And they're all different. Yeah. They're... Um, w- that's I think that's one of the things that is very different about our label in comparison to other labels that exist now where uh, somebody will work in primarily a, a specific kind of metal or a specific kind of hardcore or punk or mm-hmm. whatnot um, but for us we just look for something that moves us you know more yeah. we're, we're we're fans of music you know I don't want to work for a band that I just don't enjoy a variety of aspects of what they are yeah. um, so, so do you think um, well, I guess that approach has always been there, obviously, from the start. I mean, the label was started, what, initially as a, as a means to, to release your stuff. But yeah, for, for the most part. But, the, you know, it's, it's funny, though. Like, I'll, I'll hear a record and, um, all right, uh, like I, I heard, like, the, the Deaf Heaven demo, for example. Visuals were very interesting. The band was doing some really interesting things and blending a variety of styles together yeah. that were being done by, by some artists, but not in the same way with the same sort of uh, subtle nuances that were there. And uh, it, was, it was really impressive to me. And uh, that, that, was, that was pretty much the beginning of that relationship. And it was actually funny, Trey and myself, who, who run Deathwish, I think we both bought the demo from the band independently. And he was just like, hey, I just got this demo I like. You want to do you, you want to check it out? And I said, like, yeah. What well, what is it? And I was like, oh, it's band Deaf Heaven. And I said, like, oh, that's the band that's the, the blue cover with the hand. I said, like, I just bought that like the other day online too, and we just started talking about it, and that's just kind of how it how it rolls. There's some projects that are more um, more my projects or more Trey's projects or or, or Rich's projects at Deathwish. Yeah. We're the three that pretty much do um, do the, the the label management aspect of things. We have nine full-time people there hmm. um but we all have a, a sort of a, a, di- a different kind of ear and um eye that gets stimulated by different things um but we all have to agree upon just the fact that the bands are are quality and are the best versions of what they can be are there ever times where where um you or trail will be at odds with each other all the time a, yeah yeah how, sure. how does that get settled it's like um, oh, I, I found this band. I think they're incredible. We should be looking at putting out the putting out a record. We've we've definitely had those conversations a ton of times. It really comes down to if some. The, I, I want to be. If I don't see it right away, or if he doesn't see it right away, we try to do our best to explain why yeah. we see those see it as a as a quality thing and see in what we what we artistically just are just getting out of it. Mm-hmm. as a fan of music um and usually that that will settle it you know because um, sometimes you're just not hearing it with the same ears yeah uh and you need a different perspective maybe you're just standing in an altogether different place and you're looking at a band and thinking that they're one thing and they're really something else and it just takes a little bit of you know time and understanding to it's to see that perspective. Yeah. yeah and that that's definitely happened a, a few times um but if somebody really believes in it and we're just like look I really want to do this this is something I feel that's really special then we respect that mm-hmm. you know because we, we we all trust each other you know the, the three of us that are that are doing that that sort of thing and, uh, you know Rich who works with us who's essentially the label manager he um, he's been with us since he was a kid he interned for us and he's been with us forever since before he was 20 years old uh, he's been there for over 10 years and so, you know, we res- we also respect his, you know, his ear and his understanding of of music as a as a fan and as a player. That's one of the things too about our our label. We we all play in some way or or have, you know. Yeah. Trey was in bands years ago, so he has an understanding of 
of all that and he's traveled with bands and has been a tour manager for he was a tour manager for a number of years for a lot of bands uh rich was in a lot of bands he ran a small recording studio for a brief time as well uh, and everybody else that works there is affiliated with a band or, or in, in some way, uh, or they're a photographer or they're, yeah. they're whatever. So it's, um, yeah, everybody's entrenched in the music community in some way. And I think that's a really important thing because there are labels that don't have that. They just yeah. have people who are just employees. And I think that's, that's the, that's the problem of why all the bigger labels are now floundering is because, sure. because you've got people who work in there that were working a job and they, they, I mean, but then that, that that's always the the strength in coming from uh, coming from a commu- like a musical community. I think all of the best labels to me, for me as a fan of music, especially when I was younger and searching for things to be a fan of, they were all labels that had direct ties to the community that they were releasing. You know. Mm. Um, whether it be like the golden era of earache or or revelation records or or whatever like all, yeah, di- yeah especially discord yeah. um all of those labels they were all deeply rooted in their communities yeah. or they were labels like sst and even epitaph that were ran by the label by the, by the bands yeah. and started by the bands as a means to release their own music yeah, exactly these are all labels that have kind of come about through necessity mm-hmm. and i think that's why most of those labels ha- have endured and and do, sure. do so and have st- and because they've stuck to a clear set of ideals without yeah. being too yeah i mean even when they're you know. sonically diverse like yeah. you, you you can look at um you can look at epitaph and they have a lot of more like commercially uh, for lack of better terminology commercially viable artists things have more they're more uh rooted in the pop territory yeah. of of punk and independent music than like the heavier more intense aspect of things um there's still there's still an understanding of, of what they are, even even earache to a, to a degree as well. I mean, they they do a, they still do a lot of catalog pieces and whatnot, but they're they're still putting out newer artists and taking risks and doing yeah. things that they're a fan of. Maybe not everybody's a fan of it, but they're doing it because they enjoy it. And there's there's something to be said about that. Yeah. Did you ever think that when when you first started the label that it would be, you know, you say you you have aside from the three of you there's another nine people employed and mm-hmm. and uh that it's it's a cornerstone for 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 a community now it, it really is like you know any band that releases on that on on your label it's a, it's a, it has that it has a stamp of approval whether you whether you think about i mean you probably don't think about it that way but it I does. don't it, but it I resonates within that within this world you know it, i think anyway I, I suppose it does i i don't i guess that's the the perspective thing is an interesting thing for me because I feel that if you start looking back at what you're doing, yeah, uh, whether it be running a label, making art, making music, whatever, as soon as you start reflecting, you're you you you're beginning the process of slowing down. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I this is just it's a psychological hang up for me, but. Yeah. I prefer to just move forward. So I prefer to just to to make something as a visual artist and move on and take what I learned and mo- and and go to, to the next project, go to the next project, mm-hmm. go to the next project. Musically, the same way. In the label perspective, it's also the same way. You know, I know that we've released records that have uh, become important uh, sort of cornerstones or just important um, little chapter marks within the community, and I'm really really honored that we've been able to do that but for me it's all about the next step because bands are all about growing Hmm. Um, that's also the heartbreaking aspect of running a record label too because you can do a fantastic job and build something along with an artist and really be proud of what you did together and then they move on yeah and you have to be okay with that because otherwise you're just a you know a scorned ex forever and ever yeah, you know, and I know from a, I know from an artistic <laughs> point of view that you know bands bands want to do different stuff, and you should never you know sort of enslave an artist to hmm. to forever work for you or work with you. Um, y- you hope that they want to continue a relationship forever and ever. 
but sometimes it doesn't work, yeah. you know, and sometimes people want to go, Hey, you know, I want to try something else. Or we just got a huge money offer from label A, B or C. And in some ways, when those things happen, you're conflicted. You are happy for the bands hmm. when those things occur because they're being recognized. And in turn, your collective effort as a record label that believes in an artist that helps build a, a title alongside of a band um, is also being recognized. And you know that people are watching and people are listening, mm -hmm. whether they, they acknowledge it or not. They acknowledge it by trying to, to work with those bands later. Yeah. Um, and so that's, it's, it's bittersweet, you know? Um, yeah, because it's not like you're looking for that... Um affirmation or vindication no whatever way you look at it but but yeah i guess but you know but you know it's there because they're they're looking yeah and you and, and, and you're and you're proud you know it's yeah. it's I, i'm proud to to look at you know an artist that you know any of any of our artists you know whether it be they move on to like a larger like metal label or like a or a more a legacy label like an epitaph or something yeah. like that or anti and they are just you know taking a different different step and just the just the fact that we're part of that process is is great i always just wonder where you know we've been doing this for a pretty long time over a decade as a you know put out over 200 releases yeah when when are we looked at it like that when does that start to happen i suppose you know like when we you know when we're i don't know i i have no idea i don't know how the world works like that but yeah. You know, I look I look at what we what we've done so far, and I go, we've we've created some really special records with a lot of special bands. And, yeah. You know, I mean, you, as you said, you know, the the community pays attention, and that's that's all we could really ask for. You know. Yeah. Um, but we're we're also a realistic record label too. We um we don't uh, get into bidding wars over bands, and mm -hmm. we don't try to do that strange game. If if artists want to work with us, that's great. If they, you know, we everything split down the middle and if it you know if that's not something they want to work you know work that way then that's that's okay too and they can go somewhere else so yeah. it's okay we just try to we we just try to um appreciate what we have that's have all. you ever been in a situation where there's a band that you've worked with for a long time suddenly comes uh, comes to you and goes well uh label x y or z oh, all has, the time. has offered us this and it, you mu it must be a tough position in a way to to say if you think that's a bad idea and they're and they're 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 being swayed by the well it's interesting we, pot we, of gold in a sense that we that we've definitely had those pot of pot of gold <laughs> conversations with people but you know it it really comes down to what the priorities are you know for yeah. some bands they'll go hey look you know we're being offered you know like tens and twenties and thirties of thousands of dollars to do something. Um, you know, and essentially labels will be overpaying for what for for what uh, a release can can deliver financially. Yeah. And some labels do that because they want to look cool and they want to have a cool band associated with yeah. them. And I can't fault an artist for making that decision. I mean, at, at this at this point in the music world, it's very difficult for any artist, never mind an independent artist, to make some sort of uh, full-time sort of career out of making music. Yeah. So if if that happens and somebody is afforded that opportunity and if that's something that fits their life goals and you know and and fits within their own moral compass, then I can't fault them for that because I'm not their moral compass. Yeah. Um, the way our band has worked. We try to stay as independent as possible, but we also still, you know, we work with Epitaph when it comes to our releases, but they also just leave us alone and let us do whatever we want. And um, we don't ask for anything. We just say, hey, here's a record. We're ready to go. And they go, okay, cool. Thanks. You know, it's pretty, it's, it's That's pretty casual. That's a beautiful casual. relationship to have. It is, you know, and I, I had a conversation. We, we were out of, out of contract for, for a while. And we weren't really, we weren't making it public because we don't care, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and we were just kind of like just still just being a band or whatever. And Brett uh, called me and he's just like, hey, I, I need to re-sign you guys. And I said, okay, whatever. Let's, let's, you know, let's talk. We're not really, you know, we're not trying to look for anything else. And, uh, you know, one thing he said to me in that conversation, to paraphrase, was like, you know, we work with a ton of different artists. 
some you know obviously you're you know you're not a fan of and they're just not in your music world and whatever yeah um and you know some you know your peers with and friends with but you know your bands and uh, you know every time i die and a variety of other bands that we work with are bands that we we want to work with that we artistically believe in what you're doing and it kind of doesn't it doesn't matter to us that you're not you know doing you know arena tours and uh taking every random strange tour offer to to try to you know grow your band in a specific way you just do your thing and i really respect that and i want to make sure that you know we can be part of that for you yeah. and uh it was it was a really good conversation that showed me that he still really understood where we were coming from you know yeah. we're not trying to to be that we're a self-sustaining you know uh, artistically driven band then that's pretty much it um from a label perspective for death wish i think that most bands that we work with come in with that head and sometimes when there's when there's success that people start to believe a little bit of hype that comes that starts coming from from a release or from you know a certain period of time and you know that's okay you know if bands get get bigger offers and that's what they want to do that's that's okay but you know now we actually have an infrastructure as a as a business that we can uh, compete in a lot of ways that um, we couldn't before. Yeah. From a distribution aspect of things. This um, ADA now. Right? Yeah. Well, we have ADA uh, worldwide for um, for like chain stores and digital and things like that. Okay. But we also have our own uh, independent uh, aspect of our business that we're our own distributor, just yeah. like uh, Revelation is. Okay. So um, we actually w- we have exclusive uh, relationships with it's 12 labels now and then we do retail placement for another 20 labels uh we do things like we do like the hydra heads independent store retail you know retail placement um uh, youth attack records you know, a yeah. wide variety of things like that um and they're, they're they're labels that we believe in that we think are artistically special that we're a fan of and that yeah. we just want to support you know so we have that aspect of the business as well and a lot of labels don't have that yeah. um then we have you know a sales team that in in house that does all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, th- I mean, this is. I I can't. Uh, I have very little entrepreneurial spirit. I think mm-hmm. so. I can't even comprehend how much work running a label and running a label for the amount of time and as successfully as you have with this one must take up. But yeah. so that's why that's why I find it so. Um, that's why I'm so impressed that amongst that. I think the band goes hand in hand with that because it because of that's essentially that's what the label was born from to a certain degree. Sure, right? It, yeah, it does. But it, it, they do go hand in hand. You know, people have to remember the first the first seven years. I mean, if they care, but like the, the first seven <laughs> years of the label, you know, is it was a full time job. Yeah, and I I didn't get paid a dime. Hmm. You know, literally, I I paid I paid for records out of my pocket. I would do design work and pay for a manufacturing bill for a blacklisted record yeah. um, because I believed in the band and I wanted it to be something special. And you know, it it took a long time for things to become profitable and to build, especially in this environment where music and art is essentially looked at as a free commodity, like mm-hmm. a, most media is. You know, like, yeah. Um, I, that's that's something I find I find so disheartening in the sense that 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 um especially within certain genres of music that are very s- scene led and i don't mean scene as in uh i mean community led sure okay that's a better way of you s- saying it you know where where everything should be about fostering this community spirit and as you said you mm-hmm. know making sacrifices sure so that so that you can advance things and make it a better place to be, right? right? A better world, which is, right? Mm-hmm. Essentially, that's what you're doing, sure. right? I think. It's to create a positive, some sort of positive environment for, yes. for creativity. Um, and yet, these are the, also the worst communities as far as that, you know, it is... Best gr- and worst. Yeah. As far as, you know, oh, I just, you know, there's, there's five new releases come out today and I go on this torrent site and I get all of those. Sure. And, and it's... I don't want to sound like like a grumpy old guy because mm-hmm. I get it, right? I, you know, 
I'm in a very privileged position because I get so much music for free. Sure. And you know, and and that is a beautiful thing. I re I really appreciate that. And and not just I don't mean just like a download of an album. I mean like mm -hmm. you know albums that I really want to own physically. Yeah, which you get you get to hold them for for yeah. no 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 effort. But yeah, yeah I mean it's well, true. But you are putting an effort in contributing to the community on your own in your in your own way. Yeah. And you know, in in being I try. a sort of well, you, well, you are. You, you're you know, you're sort of a a personality and a talking head that represents <laughs> a lot of those things, which is hugely positive. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people wouldn't hear about bands if it wasn't for people like you. So yeah, it's um, Maybe. yeah. I mean, but, it, it, it's but, it's an important yeah. role. Yeah. Okay. But um, the the I thing shall. I the thing I find this hard. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it is the way that, that it just just seems to be like that stuff just gets just taken for granted and just it, stolen it, music just online it does i think it was worse a few years ago yeah i think, I think yeah, it's it, true. What, what's what's happening now is you're you know you're getting the the media companies like you know like spotify and apple and whatnot trying to uh sort of commoditize things and 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 make streaming the essentially the only way you can listen to music and experience hmm. music in some way and they're they're it, it's we're in a really strange place where those those companies aren't necessarily paying artists and record labels the way they should be yet um but they're in some ways creating a business model and a platform that could potentially um be the new uh, the new way music is is experienced, you know, yeah. and it's making you know torrent sites and and whatnot harder and harder to to use yeah, and true. come by and, and 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 I think you know the benefits of that are that bands are getting their music out there. And well, even if it's a fraction of a penny, see, people don't understand that you know when you steal a record, uh, that's to experience it and you get something you know uh, emotional out of the album and you get to experience it. That's that's somebody's somebody's work that's mm. that's somebody's vision they put in a lot of effort and a lot of a lot of heart to to make that exist and then it just becomes uh immediately uh disposable you know it's it's interesting this the music and art world is kind of a a strange place where you have to convince people that what you create is worth is worth purchasing because it's essentially a car with keys already in it. Somebody yeah, could yeah. just drive it away yep. for free, and not, or or they pay for the car, <clears throat> um, and they support the car. Uh, and it's it, it, it's a difficult thing, you know. Somebody could be a fan of your band but still not want to financially pay for things, you know. Yeah. When when I was a kid, I would save every dollar I had to buy a new a new cassette every week or two. Yeah. That's what I did. You know, they were like eight or nine bucks, and I would just kind of scrounge around money and do what I could to to have that. And that's what I spent my money on. And I think about that now, and I was probably spending, you know, anywhere between like fifty and a hundred bucks on records a month. Mm. And imagine somebody spending a hundred dollars on music a month now. Mm. They, it's it's not even. Um, it's it, it it's not even something that a lot of listeners of music using streaming services could even understand because yeah. they don't they, they might not collect physical music anymore and and the other side to that is that you had to live with what you bought sure like, you was, can make you can make bad decisions oh, for a week so many so and many I would bad try, albums yeah. i would buy just because of, like the art well it's cool as fuck i got really into <laughs> buying I, I used to buy promo cassettes because it's all i could afford when i got into college there's a couple of used stores and yeah uh vinyl was was like at that point like a dollar a, a record so you can buy that but I travel, you know. I was I was on riding my bike everywhere, and so I always had a you know a Walkman with me. And so yeah, I would buy exactly two dollars, yeah, two dollar cassettes yeah. constantly, <laughs> and that's how you know that's how I got you know like Slaughter of the Soul the first time was you know like a promo cassette I bought for two bucks at at uh, Nuggets Records in Kenmore Square in Boston, and you know like stuff like that. I just bought just the white bought. The white sleeve with a white sticker on it. Yeah, yeah, that was it. I bought yeah, I bought so much of that stuff. <laughs> And you know, even I, I would actually say that I've said this before, but the um, the the death of the traditional record label model actually happened when used record stores starting popping up, mm -hmm. and uh, and even like uh, larger chains like used CD stores, yeah. they used to buy people's collections because what was happening was you would get 
uh, whole whole collections sold to these to these stores, and they'd be offered for you know a, a slight discount. But they were still paying close to retail. Maybe like if a CD was twelve dollars at that point in the in time in the in the economy at home, you could get a used version for eight dollars or something. Yeah. But that eight dollars, it's you know, it's being resold and resold. But none of that money is going to the artist yeah. now. And now that's a you have this this mo- and and that CD was purchased for a dollar from you know from mm. the person who sold it to you or for store credit yeah. or something like that. Uh, and that's when you started having the disconnect. Uh, between the 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 bands being compensated in some manner or the labels being compensated in some manner that would trickle down to bands um, that started breaking and then it was just going just purely to the retail end yeah. of things and I feel that retail kind of contributed to their own downfall by doing that so as soon as um, the streaming services kicked in or even before that when torrents started you know occurring and you know you had the the first the, the first big online battles with um, with a, a variety of, of services that were out there um, that's the, they were greatly affected and that's yeah. why you had stores trying to go away yeah I never really thought of that it's true yeah that was the it, it's it's pretty interesting to, to think about that aspect of things and hey like you know we all we all contribute to it because you yeah. know we just wanted to hear music mm. um, I feel that maybe if if retail back then was a little more artist friendly and consumer friendly maybe maybe in music wasn't so inflated at the time maybe records shouldn't have cost you know ten dollars each at the time maybe they should have been five dollars each which was you know in in comparison with with today's you know inflation that was that was a ton of money as well Mm -hmm. ton of money ton of money Uh, that was that was a ton of money that was being generated that wasn't going back into the what people would consider the music industry whether it be major or independent um, and that's a it, it's an interesting thing that people don't really talk about that yeah. that much, um, but you know again it is what it is. I can I I could you know pack it in tomorrow and decide not to to play music anymore and not contribute to it. But for the, the fact of the matter is I'm you know I'm a life artist and life musician, and I'm involved in a variety of ways. And you know yeah it might be an uphill battle mm. in in some ways um, economically, but I don't care. I feel that I'm doing something that's um, that's relevant. That's relevant. That's some sort of, I don't know, for lack of better terminology, again, it's a, it, it's a calling. It's, it's, yeah. it's what I have. You yeah. Know? Even when we start, we started the label, when uh, downloading was just blowing up. You know, yeah. essentially 2000. You know, in in 2000, it was downloading was was a real a real thing. It was everywhere. Um, Metallica was fighting their their fights yeah. and. Things were things were real messy for a while, and we actually, as a label, started giving away our releases almost immediately, uh, and we got in trouble for that. Um, I don't know if it, there might be some people that may remember the f- first incarnations of of the Death Wish label online. As soon as we had um, the masters to a record, hmm. we made a radio player and put the entire record right up online immediately, yeah. uh, and then we started working with. Uh, some other labels doing split releases and things, and they were really upset about that because they really valued the uh, the exclusivity and being able to present a record in some way. And we were just like, it's going to get out there. Yeah. Let's just get it out there right away and be like, hey, here's the record. You know, enjoy it or don't. And the physical version will be released in you know X amount of time. Since then, the playing field sort of changed, and you have to kind of you you, you kind of have to be part of of the machine a little bit in order to. Mm-hmm. Um, generate revenue for bands and for labels but back then we just didn't care and we just threw it up there and it was it was fun you know yeah i think it's funny as well when when um going back to what you were saying about how because i was the same you know you you would you would scrimp and save and you'd be able to be like go get one one album yeah one album a week week. yeah and 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 i made so many poor decisions based Mm -hmm. on artwork which is which is which is funny because um it shows the importance of how how um, a distinctive piece of artwork for oh, an album sure. is is a selling point, and 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 it it then makes me think about you know that that's as we were discussing earlier with with you as a visual artist, that's one of the things that you're equally known for is mm-hmm. is, is your art, and uh, and I, I'm curious as to like do you distinguish between like obviously being so driven and 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 working you know that there's a financial need 
mm -hmm. to, to, to work on certain things. But do you, how do you separate between what you're going to look at as I'm doing commissions for this band, this band, this band, this band, this band and, and now I'm doing uh, personal, personal work or sure. fine art, or sure. however you want to term that? It's it's an interesting situation to be in, um, yeah. and I don't think I ever have a solid answer there as to how I can differentiate those those experiences because it all kind of comes from the same place. Yeah. Um, because you you're using the same skill set, you're using yeah. the same brain to do those things. I look at design work and sort of creating a character, a visual character, alongside a band for a band or for a release or whatever as as a unique challenge because it's not my my artistic voice you know there's some illustrators and some fine artists like like a puss head for example where you see it yeah. and that's a clearly you know like a puss head piece and that is what it is and it's just going that it enhances the the art the the release in some way yeah but it's also but like, your art's like that i find in some ways but i do a lot of stuff that people don't know that i do ah okay um, I do a lot of design work that people don't know that I do. Yeah, um, my name might be in the credits and might not be, hmm. um, but I've you know I've worked for a lot of a lot of bands, just doing that sort of thing. Okay, because um, I've always looked at design as an interesting challenge. Like I, I went to when I went to college, I I went and. Uh, and when we, you know, graduated from college and well, my BA in design okay. primarily. And I Where went, did you do that? I w when did I do it? Where? Uh, the Art Institute of Boston, which was purchased by Leslie University back at, back at home. So now it's part of Leslie University, which used to be, um, yeah, it was, it was just a different college. So they mm. just essentially merged the two. And it was uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. It was called the Boston School of Practical Art before it changed the name but it's, it's not affiliated with any of those there's there's like a um at back at home there's like a some sort of like online college or like some sort of like college uh, that's called the art institutes that do like animation hmm. and, and things but that advertise on television that's sort of like a uh, almost like a company it's not it's not that yeah. it's a different thing but they um there was an interesting time in my life you know four years of you know going to school and doing foundation programs and whatnot and I initially went in as a fine artist predominantly a painter yeah um then I got interested in photography and then I needed to make a decision as to what I was going to do was to try to try to pull off some sort of double major go to school for a little longer um or concentrate in something and I kind of fell into the design department because typography always interested me mm -hmm. um grid systems uh the, the science of all of that i always found to be pretty exciting and interesting hmm. um the history of, of of typography and whatnot was always interesting to me and um it also combined all of the arts you kind of had to be a little bit of everything to be able to, to be a good designer yeah um, or at least be able to communicate that language to, to somebody else that you're commissioning yeah, work coherently from. definitely yeah, yeah. And, and that was that was a unique challenge and so i ended up in the design department and ended up uh, you know, concentrating on that for my uh, my junior and senior years and ended up doing my thesis in that and graduating you know with my BA in design um, but I still did a lot of photography while I was there and this is you know predating digital stuff and so yeah. a lot of darkroom time and whatnot um, and I was still doing you know fine artwork that was sort of turning into mixed media work which then people define as illustration work and it's just kind of to me it's just it, it's all the same you know you're just yeah it's a means to an end if it looks like something then you made it and it's art this is what it is yeah um that was an interesting time for me though I, I didn't really relate to the people in my school um i didn't really have too many friends there i just i, I worked a lot uh to to pay for school and pay a living for, you know through school hmm. Um, you know, I got some grant and some financial aid and stuff like that, but it was still still hard, and it took me years after getting out of school to finish paying for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same. It, yeah. It just takes a while, and yeah. Um, but I I learned a lot about the artistic process in that time, especially my my junior and senior years, hmm. and uh, I I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, it. Um, I, I think those environments, are, like I said, on this last one with John, is because he he had. You know what we can call formal training. Yeah, I he guess. went to RISD, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah. And it's um, it, it those can sometimes be less about the the 
the instruction and the teaching as much as it is uh, as they are about the environment. Sure, it's to be in that to be going to a place where you're in this mindset of 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 making this creative work. Definitely, and you're you know, you're surrounded by like-minded people, yeah. whether they whether they understand what you're doing, yeah. you know, and and vice versa is you know, altogether a, a different thing. But it's also about maturity and just kind of uh, finding yourself uh, as a as a creative person. You, mm. you you're not you're not a kid anymore. You know, so mm. There's real life consequences to your decisions. You know, yeah. my my first year of school, I fucked off a ton. Because it was, it was my foundation program. I went to my figure drawing stuff and my color theory stuff. And I just I just would skip things and just hang out with my roommate and just, and, and just fuck around. And it was funny. My, my apartment building and my school just it was, wasn't even planned. It was just the only apartment we could get when we moved to the city. Uh, they, they, my, back, my, my, my back windows to our apartment faced some of my classrooms in my school. And uh, my um, my dean was one of my teachers, and he he could see if I was skipping his class because <laughs> I would just be you know hanging out Bad and buddy. just listening to records yeah. and stuff. And I, there was not I couldn't afford blinds, and I didn't put sheets <laughs> on the windows, so That's I didn't amazing. care. And I remember I, I walked in I walked into the building one day, and he pulled me aside, and he's like, "Look." He goes, you know, he's like, you're, you're, you're talented and you, and you have a lot of potential here, but if I, I, I can't see you skipping my class <laughs> and yeah, you, know, you have to start, he's like, you have to start coming to class. And I was like, okay. And so I, I started at that point, uh, you know, taking it a little more seriously, but you know, you're a kid, you're free, you know, yeah. I, I was like 17 years old at the time. I was mm. a kid. I, I graduated from college, uh, from high school early. And so I was, you know, thrown into, like, I, gra- I graduated from college when I was 21. Wow. You know, um, which is pretty young now. Most people are like in their early to mid twenties when they're getting out of that. Yeah. Uh, so I was, you know, and I just came off my first U.S. tour. Um, I just didn't, you know, I was just just living free and enjoying it. You know, yeah. just a a lot of freedom. But I, you know, I, again, I wouldn't trade any of that time for for anything. It was really important. You are saying about the mixed media thing and and about. Um working on design stuff that, that, that people wouldn't necessarily recognize or know about. But um, when, when I see your, your artwork... Sure, like the more, the, the more expansive real artwork, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so distinctive. And sure. I'm, I'm curious as to, to what it is, because I've, I've never really... You know, I look at it and I see it's multi-layered and it's, it's mixed media, clearly, but um, I never, I've never really figured out what how how you work it's it's so difficult to figure out because there's no rules yes yeah. that and that comes from the design head you know uh in me when i when i was going to school one thing that really struck me was uh, an example that one of my design chairs told me she she was like look you know she's telling me a story of so i forgot what at this right now, I forgot what designer it was, but they were doing some sort of series of posters for whatever, and they were under a huge deadline, a huge client, and this is in the the primordial days of of computers, mm. and they did a nice traditional design at the time, and then their hard drive crashed, and this is when you used to have to take your machines to a service bureau to print something. Mm. Um, that's actually how I used to have to output large files. You would take your your actual yeah. desktop, you know, like stick it in a box, get on the train, <laughs> drive it down to a place, they plug it in, you know, because there was no storage, you know. It's crazy now yeah. when you think about oh, it. Oh, it's totally it? crazy, the stuff that we used to do. Mm. Uh, this designer had, you know, a, a complete disaster. They lost everything. They had like, you know, four hours to make something. And they made a successful award-winning design out of duct tape and exacto, you know, just cutting exacto blades and, and creating, you know, just like really dynamic typography yeah. that way because they didn't have any letters set around. You know, they yeah. just made something totally crazy and out of control. And that planted a seed in me and made me realize that I could take my sort of uh, – my background and just being, you know, like a punk kid and a hardcore kid and, and doing um, like big sort of like mixed media collage things with photography and a Xerox machine and uh, taking all this work and all these ideas and like build, I, that's how I was building stuff like that. You know, you build flyers, you build fanzines and stuff. And I would look at things like 
um, like Misfits visuals and Godflesh visuals yeah. and Napalm Death visuals and all these like big, wild looking things. And they were always so expressive and so powerful, but they were and they were pulling from everywhere. They were just these wild collages, and you had all these, you know, more um, fine art oriented people that were doing those sort of same things. And I was like, I think I can. I have a I have a vision of how I want to do this, but I want to treat it more like fine art, and I want to I want to give it a different kind of voice. And so I started doing experiments like that, and uh, you know, doing a lot of. A lot of spray paint work, a lot of stencil work, a lot of photography, a lot of found source image stuff. There's motorcycles going by. Um, and I just, you know, and just working with basic composition and uh, basic grid systems and design rules and design principles that I was sort of implementing from my graphic design background and putting them in like, compositionally into, into this world, which really yeah. was never really done before. And there's a lot of happy accidents. That's what I like to call them, you know, because, yeah. again, there are no rules, you know. So if I want to make, um, for example, like the, the crescent moon for the um, for the, the converged blood moon stuff, I did a lot of cut and paste. I probably made 20 or 30 different moons out of pieces of com- converged imagery. Hmm. Just playing with it, cutting and pasting, um, you know, drawing some stuff, Xeroxing it, um, you know, taking an exacto knife to it trying to rebuild it and yeah. just kind of keep building skeletons and skeletons and then doing lots of gouache work lots of spray paint work lots of um handmade gradient stuff and the thing is people will look at it and go i wonder how he made that and they'll and they'll go i wonder how he made that digitally and so it's not digital it's because there's like sixty thousand little paintings in yeah. my room that's why you can't replicate it it's yeah. you know um same with the typographic element of things. You know, things all start off and and uh, with traditional typefaces that I respect and admire, but then they're a little sort of distorted and and, and manipulated and, mm. and changed, and they they still follow the same typographic principles that they were meant to, but I'm giving them a little bit different of a voice, a little bit cruder of a voice, and that's all influenced by you know the the punk rock and hardcore metal yeah. worlds. You know, you just you just make what you can. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You use what what's the hand, mm-hmm. and I and I try to, for, especially for converge related material. You know, I, I there's a certain aesthetic that we've just sort of built around the band that just mm. is what it is, and it's just kind of happened naturally. What what kind of scale are these are these pieces when you're working on them? It really Does depends. It, vary? it it varies. It, a long time ago, I used to do it just things just to fit on a scanning bed, and mm. then scanning yeah. Got, yeah, then scanning got bigger. And then photography got bigger, and so now I can, you know, uh, I can make a bigger, you know, large abstract, you know, like gouache background of something um, that has like lots of vibrant fluorescence and neons in it, and I can photograph it, and I can use it, and I can have that flexibility. Sometimes I'll build something totally physically, and it'll just be its own standalone thing ready to go. Yeah. Um, sometimes if I'm building something for an album, I know it's going to need flexibility and be able to be a backdrop or have you know multi multi uses and so i have to build things in such a way where i can uh so that's strip consi- them down so that's definitely a consideration when you're working on certain things <laughs> yes it has to be and that, and yeah. that and that comes from the design perspective too yeah. and uh you know as as it's always been uh much harder to say for example i made the like the blood moon piece if i made that and just made it as a standalone piece i wouldn't have had the flexibility i would have had needed to make a wide variety of other things for it hmm. so i had to make all the pieces sort of individually okay um but yeah again there are no rules it's always dictated by the job to job yeah as yeah. long as each piece has a strong visual identity and yeah as long as it captures especially if it's something for converge it needs to capture the the sort of uh the emotional um the, the emotional weight of what we're trying to convey or something that's just, you know, multi-layered and crazy and just cap, you know, it, there's always a push and pull. There's always something. There's always some sort of narrative that I'm working towards. If, yeah. if I if I hit it on the head, that's great, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm only going to hit it on the head for me. You know, somebody else can see it and just see a bunch of colors or some might see, um, you know, like a silhouette and something and identify it in such a way for themselves. You know, as, as you know, like once you create art, it's no longer yours. So yeah. the second that you give away a song or a piece of, you know, visual anything to the world, people are going to interpret it however they want. Yeah. So 
as long as I feel that I've captured something solid for myself or a client feels I've captured something for them the way that they intended or way that, the way that they wanted to see something, yeah. then I've done a successful job. Do you consider the stuff that when you're making art that that is for Converge, do you consider that to be the same thing as making personal work? Because yeah, of the, that's or a tough is one. Because there must be like a blurred line where you're so... Uh, you know, it's very different making making artwork for another band because you uh, you know you want to make a visual identity for it. You right. want it, you want it to be a striking piece. You want it to to say what you've heard within their music or and right. take into consideration anything that they've said. Sure, but e- even you're invested so much more within Converge. Therefore, that line between it being a, almost a commission and personal work. It's, it's a very it's, blurry line. Yeah. Um, you know, and for some, even for some uh, artists that I just do some basic design work, they might have an entire record almost done, and it just needs a little bit of massaging to get. Mm-hmm. You know, like some bands will come in and say, I, "This is the aesthetic I want," and it, you know, it might identify with a a specific style or time period in music, and I say, "You almost hit it on the head," but you have a, but the the typographic choice mm. um, could be stronger, and here's why. You know, like the typeface that you know band a b or c used was this and it has a specific kind of weight and it you know it, it, if you add this effect to it it does this da, da, da. and so i try to and that and that's me trying to make the best version of somebody else's vision and i have to do that quite often especially yeah. for death wish stuff because yeah. you know again everybody has a different take on things with converged things you're right the, the line blurs a lot and it's um it's very personal and very intense and a lot of times i don't know if what i made is even what i intended uh, towards the end of it hmm. um and you have to be okay with that process you know you you could hope that you you hit everything and you got the narrative that you're trying to to get out there but you know, sometimes sometimes you're just so lost in the process, especially yeah. if you work on something for a long time. Like the like the All We Love, We Leave Behind pieces I did. Um, I did 17 different um, 17 different final pieces, and there was probably like a, a hundred and change done leading up to that that I yeah. you know kind of got rid of or just you know threw in the trash or pushed a different direction. Wow! And that that took me six months, and so by the time I was done. I wasn't sure if like the if I really captured what I wanted to. Um, like you lost sight of it through like couldn't see the forest for the trees kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah. then at the same time, when when you're amongst the piece, then then that's when the uh, um, depending on how you want to look at it, the inner voice, the the muse, whatever. That's sure. when that that kind of takes control a little. It does. You know, it's funny. I've I've talked about this this book a bit but there's a there's a short book that um i believe my friend uh mike mckenzie who plays another thing gunface he's the guitarist in the red cord Mm -hmm. stomach earth unraveler a wide variety of bands um he told me about a book a long time ago a really short book called art and fear that i picked up and i believe it's written by two different different authors and they just talk about the creative process and and they break it down in a variety of ways. And the, one of the things that really struck... I'm going to write this down. Sure. I don't need to write this down. I'm getting recording it. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, Sorry. I'll show it. I have it in the, ba- <laughs> I, I have it in the back. It's my plane reading. I, t- I take it with me often. Um, but, it, you know, it, it kind of goes through a wide variety of things regarding the creative process. But one thing that really st- struck a chord with me is how... Uh, and I never really thought about this before until reading the book. Was all visual artists and all musicians spend so much time trying to... C- trying to perfect something Mm. and what perfection really is is the sort of psychological exercise of removing yourself and your character from that piece okay Mm. Um, because more often than not what you see in your head and what you envision or hear, hear in your mind isn't what is coming through in what you're creating Yeah, and you spend so much time just sort of working through that and sort of just exhausting yourself over this 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 small little nuance of something but then you, you and you, and you lose you lose perspective in that because really the the you the 
the subtle nuances of your character and of your voice and of your hand of your you know musical ear or whatever that's what makes it interesting yeah 100 percent. and all of us even if we're confident in who we are and what we do we always when we when we try to push forward we always try to remove ourselves from that and become a, a sort of sharper, more improved version of what we are. But really, it's the flaws that make us the most interesting aspects of what we are as artists and musicians and whatnot. And not flaws meaning like wrong notes or like, you know, bad uh, color choices or compositional choices, but like this, this small wavy line here or the fact that, you know, this thing is doesn't really fit into the... Uh, uh, you know, vi- visual vernacular of something that I've already created, you know, like sometimes the best thing is the thing that happened the fastest, you know, yeah. without, you know, y- you exhausting yourself emotionally over it over and over again. And I, I keep that little book with me to re- kind of remind me of that a lot, you know, because sometimes now I, I'll make something and it might be a little off and I kind of enjoy it being a little off. Um, you know, and artists like Dan Higgs always did stuff like that too, you know, where like, um, there, I remember there was a there was a, a skull that I saw that he drew a long time ago where the jaw was just like in a random place for no reason yeah. you know he could have put it in he could have put it where it was supposed to but it was just you know hanging maybe 30 degrees off <laughs> where, where normally it would have and it was the the brilliance was in that choice was in, was in the, the choice to just say this is just different it's choosing to live somewhere else and for reasons unknown hmm. Um, but then, it, you know, it, it just let, lets you see things in a, in a, in a different way. And I try, to, I, I try to apply the things I, that I've learned from that book in, you know, in my creative process and in my, you know, uh, sort of process books and things like that. I'm, I'm always impressed when you post things from your process book and your sketchbook as you go because it's, it's so important to have those things. Yeah. Mine are these um, giant piles of messes that yeah. every once in a while I'll take them and try to implement them all into a book and just kind of have them all kind of documented. But yeah. I have more piles than I do books. See, I, I have got to a point now where if, if I make a piece in a sketchbook, mm-hmm. I'm aware that it's a sketchbook. Okay. I know that it's not, this isn't... It's not done. Yeah. yeah. And yet, if if I feel it doesn't reach a certain not a standard but yeah if it feels off i have to paint over it yeah and that's it's that's crazy. you trying to take you out exactly. of it exactly but some of that's but, healthy and some of that's not yeah and it's about it, it, it's not necessarily about getting rid of that that idea of trying to always always improve it's more about just being aware of that and being aware yeah. that sometimes you're trying to erase what's making something so great hmm yeah that's true yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a tough call though yeah oh sure and you know having a process book too um i don't know if anyone's a visual artist out there that, that's listening to this but if they don't keep that sort of thing around it's hard to to keep up on it it's like the equivalent of keeping up with the diary you're not going to get it yeah. all the time you're not going to mm. do it as much as you want to do or you know you're not going to be able to catalog every idea that you really want to but but try you know, and that's one of the things I took from uh, going to college and yeah. the design department. And really, it was because you work through so many versions of things for so long, especially in the design and illustration world, that you could lose sight of your initial vision, you know, and you might be 14 steps above where you were last time you looked in your book and you're totally lost and you're just really you're really just like losing sight of your initial idea and you can go back and you can reference where you were before why it was successful peel back all the layers again start over yeah. or at least bring things back to where they were the most visually successful and artistically uh, successful for you yeah and which makes those those failures or mistakes still a benefit yeah, I it's mean, the same with everything. I think. Yeah, I mean, it, maybe if somebody is is m- only a, a technical person, they can just look at like auto saved versions of things in yeah. their in their photoshops and histories to see where things were prior. Yeah, you know, because there's people too that don't work visually anymore and physically anymore on, mm. on visuals. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I I found that when I was at when I was at college, all my work went from being physical paintings and drawings to to working in like working in the the first versions of photoshop yeah for which was just such hard work sure but it was 
but it was a it, it felt like a new challenge and, mm -hmm. and everything was like manipulated photos with paintings in and well and you know I was obsessed with certain artists that that were kind of working within that field and it was a huge influence on me and now sure. now now that I've got the opportunity to do whatever like the opportunity to work on com like digital art is so is mind blowing when I see some of the stuff that people are turning out. It's unbelievable. And yet, and yet all I want to do is just get a piece of paper and <laughs> yeah, you well, draw you, on it. Now. I mean, that's kind of part of like this whole world of of music and art. We're all reactionary, you know, yeah. and like you want to use the digital aspect of things to enhance things and bring things to life, but you don't want to depend on it. You still yeah. want to be able to uh, create something that's visually interesting without it. Yeah, you know, and be so. able to have your chops. It's just a, it's it's a punk way of looking at things. Do you, when when you're making art and and music, because something I found interesting was a, a while ago I spoke to um, Scott Kelly mm -hmm. and I was talking to him about neurosis just for an interview, and I'm very much of the opinion that certain art and music as art. Mm -hmm. um, comes from a place that you can work towards and then when you get there you have very little control over sure. or not little control over it it it, it it's it takes almost, a life of its own it's a hidden hand sure that's guiding sure right yeah. do you believe that because i remember him saying that when when neurosis would be making music it was um you can look at it in different ways but like uh, a rap um he said that there was an extra voice in the room. Sure, but it, it, the, especially that band, oh, of they, they, they transcend. Uh, they they transcend any sort of parameters that would consider them uh, a traditional band. You mm. know, they're um, and they did it a long time ago. Yeah, they made that leap. You know, I saw them in their early incarnations when I was a kid, and when they finally created. When they created Souls at Zero, that's when everything changed hmm. uh, for that band, you know, and, and, and working towards that. And I think that's when the other voice entered the room, you know. And it's a collective voice. It's almost like their collective consciousness yeah. is becomes what the band is. And you see it, and it's a powerful thing. There's a, there, there, there's some other artists out there that, that aspire to, to be that, too. Yeah. I think that it's something that happens naturally, though, through through creating you know it's not something that you can just capture as a as a younger artist like a, a 20 year old me couldn't couldn't do what a 39 year old me can do now and mm. that's and that's not knocking the 20 year old me it's just sort of experience refinement understanding of my own artistic process and also understanding the uh the collaborative creative voice you know and respecting where everybody's coming from you know mm. you a lot of younger artists and musicians tend to want to be the biggest and loudest thing in the room, you know, even if they, even if they're all trying to say the same thing, you know, but it's all about easing back and kind of falling into, into a, a different sort of collective space in like for a band like Neurosis, for example, and transcending being just like a bunch of individuals playing together mm. and acting as one. Yeah. And that's a special thing. And it, and it happens. You, you see it happen with a wide variety of bands. It happens with rock bands. It happens with metal bands, punk bands. And now those are the, the brilliant nights when you see something come together, when something is um, when something is, is taking a, a next leap forward and something that's truly special. You can't quite put your, put your finger on, but it's something um, just, just real and... Uh, altogether powerful. I know, and like Nate, otherworldly, I think I would say so. Even yeah. Nate was talking to me about um, how affected he was the other day. I mean, he went and saw Savages play on the, the most recent U.S. tour, and we've seen them play a, a few times. Played some festivals together, and they were a good band. But he said they, you know, for him that day, they they really transcended and they became something altogether different. When everybody locks in and becomes something that moves and has a certain ebb and flow mm. together. Uh, you can't put your finger on it, um, but it, maybe it, maybe it's just a sensory overload thing where, like, you know, human perception just looks at something and we just go, we cannot comprehend how awesome this is. This is just otherworldly. Yeah. But you know, that's fine. That's that's where the magic lives. You know, I, I believe it is magic. Yeah, and I it, do. it sounds a little. A yeah. lot of people would just kind of think that sounds like crazy. No, head well, talk, well, you but, know, um, there's so much white noise in the world. It takes it takes something special to rise above that. 
Hmm. And when it does and when it affects you, it could be a singer songwriter alone with a guitar, you know, in a in a dark, you know, quaint room, or it could be um, a loud twelve piece band. Um, it could be a billboard. It could be a crack in the wall. It could be the way that you see concrete fracture while you're walking to work on, hmm. a, on a sidewalk. But something will connect with you sometimes, and uh, it connects with you in such a way that it reminds you that there's there's always something more out there. And I think that something more is what a lot of people consider magic. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's a great point to finish on. No, I, uh, it's, a, it, it's a good one. I mean, I get that was one thing too I learned from school. <laughs> you know, like you get inspired by everything. You get yeah. inspired by. Um, you get inspired by bad things because bad, when you see bad things and you go, that's I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I, yeah. you know, you, and, and now we're we're surrounded by such me, so much media mm. and so much. I see. I think that's a form of magic. Yeah, because so. it, it is. It's it's. Do you know much about Austin Osmond Spare? No. Okay, so he was a British artist and a cultist. Okay, and. Um, he was like an associate of Crowley in the early days. Okay. You'd, you'd probably find it really interesting, actually. But he, he basically, through typography, mm -hmm. invented a form of chaos. What we now know as like chaos magic. You okay, know? yeah. Through sigilization. I've you seen know, all like the chaos magic. Okay, symbols, so yeah. like all like, um, you know, Temple of Psychic Youth, this mm -hmm. idea of sigilization about uh, creating a pictogram mm -hmm. through... Through, a, through an idea and focusing on that um, and generally that would be through well with Topi it was through jerking off mm -hmm. essentially but mm -hmm. you know you'd be focusing on this pictogram which represents like a, a, an instruction or a desire or a means of to project okay. will right um, and then it gets buried in the subconscious and um, and, and you look at yeah, so, so Spare created that essentially um, he's an amazing artist, an incredible draftsman as well. But that's that's what that's what modern um, design is. You know, we are, yeah. yeah, we're walking. You know, we're out quoting Fugazi too much. But you you know, mm -hmm. why can't I walk down the street? Mm -hmm. You know, free of suggestion because it's like you the, cannot. It's it's is everything around you is like it. it every, everything has become like a magical sigil oh. where it's just it, like it has. So it, it's. Uh, as soon as you see one thing, it's a whole history and like vocabulary of ideas and. Well, e even Ian's line is faulted there because it's the, the. As soon as you're walking down a street, you're walking down something that's predetermined and created by somebody. Yeah. That you're walking. You're walking down something that's navigated. The only pure way of, of doing that would be like uh, walking through the woods, not on a path. Hmm. You know, free of suggestion. Yeah. You know, free of any sort of. As soon as there is a, a human, element to something, your suggestion. Yeah. As soon as there's a city. I mean, think about the think about environmental design. I mean, in an old city like this or like Boston, it's especially London, but you know, Boston too is looked at in such a way where where like people are like, oh, the streets don't make any sense. There's one ways that go around triangles that do this and do that and streets that lead to nowhere and things aren't like on a grid system like they are in New York where they bulldozed everything to the ground and started over and gave it a grid system and made a you know a, a navigational a nav navigable city. Um, somebody made these decisions. To, to make these things the way they are. And then, you know, design has come into play, whether it be environmental design, signage, um, just anything that makes you navigate through your daily life. Somebody's made all of those decisions for you. Hmm. It's very interesting to think about. And, you know, you can either go along with that and feel connected to those people and, you know, appreciate that or, you know, rebel against that or look for the flaws in that, you know. Um, I think we all just get too too lost in the white noise to really give it much much thought or attention. Yeah. But I, I think it's important to, to have a, a sense of awareness of all of those things, whether it be good or bad around you, you know, whether it be signage that offends you or a visual that inspires you, you know. Yeah. Because you're taking them in whether you're aware of it or not. Exactly. You are. There's always a, a trickle of it. There's a subconscious yeah. that there's something, you know, you can walk, I can walk by this document solution center 12 times today and it, you know, it doesn't do anything for me. It's not going to, it's not going to connect with me in any day of life, but who knows, maybe like 
Oh, maybe I'll be inspired by the way that the sign is not sitting pure on that grid, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. Does that frustrate you, things like that? Because that clearly, you know... That's a designer you have a, in me. You have, yeah, you have a designer's eye and you've mentioned typography Oh, Quite grid systems times. and stuff always, yeah, are always that really this infuriating uh, stuff like you know, that. I mean, I, 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 I'm not very typographically minded. I, I did it as part of my degree, but, sure. but yeah, certain things, man, really. Sometimes it really gets, dissonance, especially right? now with the uh, influx of digital, <laughs> where like people just don't understand the use of type. It was, it yeah. was far worse before when you know when photoshop and illustrator came along and it's sort of like early days and people were just making everything glow and putting strokes around everything yeah. and stretching things out you'd be like oh you're destroying this typographic form <laughs> it's like the worst thing you could possibly do you know it's funny it actually has uh <laughs> it, it has ties to music too because you know, we, as a band we're a very like uh analytical band and uh, you know, Kurt's a scientist in his brain. He's a he's a right brain person. If there's if there's any right brain person in our band, yeah. and so he looks at things in in a in a very interesting way. You know, music in some ways, the science almost supersedes the the cre the creative in in him sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. and so things are about you know breaking things down mathematically and what makes sense. We don't, and you know, y you talk about the the sound of things and the sort of. Um, the character of things uh, of a riff or something like that or a chord progression but there's certain things that would drive him crazy like when he's like recording like a band like old man gloom and he you know they're all our friends and they do wonderful things but they'll make musical decisions just to be off-putting you yeah. know crooked on purpose essentially so all of a sudden something will just like veer off a course for no reason at all and just be like why did you make that <laughs> musical decision that's exactly that's why. why that's yeah. the art just it's <laughs> it's it's the crooked jaw in a dan higgs thing yeah. it's why like i'm trying to get get comfortable with something being off center just a hair or you know like not fitting into the grid um it, but it, it's important even if you don't uh, even even if you don't apply those lessons all the time it's just important to be aware of them because again it, it makes it's off-putting for some people you know it's a yeah, it's an interesting thing. I look again. I look at everything, and uh, and I find inspiration in what I like and dislike. Hmm. So that's okay. It's, it's all valid. It's funny how your environment can affect you without you being actually aware that it is. Oh yeah, I mean, especially if somebody is living in. in I mean, that's just a, never mind. But that's consumerism. But even yeah. like, even just the impressions of, you know, the the environment that you are around if you live in a dilapidated city if you live in a beautiful city if you live in you know rural countryside yeah. you know what appeals to you are sort of you know animalistic psychological needs you know we are all different kind of animals you know and in really being life's too short to make those bad decisions and put yourself in a position that just makes you miserable you know yeah. and realizing wow why am i so uptight all the time it's like oh because i don't want to live in the middle of nowhere or i want to live you know, or I do want to live in the yeah. middle of nowhere. It's it's really up to up to everybody. Everyone has their own sort of um, their own frequency when it comes yeah. to that sort of thing. Well, that was podcast episode six. I hope you enjoyed it. You can look at a bunch of Jacob's stuff online, like on Instagram. It's uh, Jay Bannon. Just use Google. I mean, it's Jake Bannon. Of course you can find his artwork and, and all things Death Wish. It's the internet. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, if you could subscribe and maybe even like and write a nice review on iTunes, that would rule because little things like that really help. This is a free podcast, so it would be cool if you could show support in that way. That would rule. I'd really appreciate it. Next episode, episode seven, is with Jason Allen Butler from Let Live, and it's, it's wicked. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, which is Swim Podcast. Hit me up 